In this lecture, I want to talk about the Rogers test. And the Rogers test is really quite significant because it provides a discrete mechanism for recognizing the expressive interest at play when a defendant makes an artistically relevant use of the mark. And the Rogers test comes from the Second Circuit in a case in which the court recognized that the Lanham Act should be construed to apply to artistic works only where the public interest in avoiding consumer confusion outweighs the public interest in free expression. So the idea here is that we are overtly, explicitly considering the First Amendment interest, considering society's interest in hearing works of creative expression and the interest in creators in making them, and recognizing that under certain circumstances, the interests of the trademark holders will necessarily yield to those interests in free expression. The new film by Federico Fellini, Ginger and Fred. And there should be some echoes here of the nominative fair use test of the Ninth Circuit. The idea that there are certain interests that are important, that need recognition in trademark law, and their recognition requires the development of a completely discrete doctrinal framework, one that is applied outside of the confines of the multi-factor test. In other words, acting as a substitute for the test. So what are the terms of the Rogers test? Essentially, we ask two questions. First of all, is the use of the mark artistically relevant to the defendant's underlying work? If it is, there is no trademark liability unless the work, quote, explicitly misleads as to the source or content of the work. And so here again, we should hear some echoes to what we've discussed before in the context of the Ninth Circuit's nominative fair use test. In the nominative fair use test's third factor, there's the question asked whether or not the defendant does anything that suggests sponsorship or endorsement on the part of the trademark holder. So it essentially asks about the dispositive fact question rather than creating factors that maybe point at it without necessarily answering the question directly. And as we saw in our discussion of the multi-factor test, sometimes when you have factors that point at things, you can cobble together a story that leads to liability, even in situations situations where we think the underlying dispositive question may not point in the direction of liability. Implicit in this, of course, is the observation that merely using a mark in an artistically relevant way should not in and of itself be something that would be deemed to be explicitly misleading. Hold that thought. So what does Rogers do? It places expressive works into a confusion framework. And so query whether Rogers is descriptive or normative. Sometimes courts will use descriptive language to describe what's going on in a Rogers analysis, making the claim that consumers expect artistically relevant uses or where you see a trademark in a title to be inherently not communicating a message about whether or not there's a connection to the trademark holder, but seeing the use of the trademark as communicating something else, say the title of the artistic work or being an aspect of that work. Now, of course, we may question whether this is descriptively true or not. We've seen the claim made in cases like Balducci that an artistically relevant use of a mark actually does suggest to at least some consumers a connection with the trademark holder. And so it's quite possible that what's really going on in the Rogers analysis is predominantly normative that there are favored kinds of uses, maybe not so much because judges think they ought to be favored, but because of the First Amendment interest in free expression that may outweigh any interest a trademark holder has. And recall that we're often dealing with an area that is a little bit removed from traditional point of sale source confusion. The consumer interest in not being confused, whatever, however we define the confusion, is not especially strong compared to the consumer interest in having free access to artistic expressions on the parts of authors. Query, of course, whether or not maybe the way to handle these problems is to lessen the scope of likelihood of confusion, lessen the scope of the trademark cause of action. But Rogers does that in effect with a certain class of cases. 
And so for an application of Rogers, consider ESS Entertainment 2000 versus Rockstar Videos. And this is the Ninth Circuit applying Rogers to defeat a claim against a video game maker for using the mark of an adult services establishment in a video game. And so, of course, in the video game, we have the use of a trademark that's very similar to the plaintiff's mark using the pig pen within the video game. And that's very similar to, or at least it's allegedly similar to, the play pen. And we have a trademark claim that says that what's going, what's going to potentially happen? There's a likelihood of confusion among consumers as to whether ESS, the plaintiff, has endorsed or is associated with the video depiction. And we've seen cases in discussing trademark infringement that entertain the possibility that consumers may perceive some kind of affiliation. And that possible misperception of affiliation, even if, even if it's not actual sponsorship, even if it's not actually standing behind the defendant's goods, may be enough to sustain a trademark claim. And we've certainly seen num a number of examples of the courts doing that. So. What is the defendant to do here? Is there a nominative fair use defense? And that doesn't work here because the defendant is not using the trademark term or the facsimile of the trademark term to describe the plaintiffs. Rather, it is simply making an appearance in the game in and of itself as being a feature of the gameplay, something in the background. So the court goes to the Rogers analysis first. Does the mark use have artistic relevance to the defendant's underlying work? And here, even though there's no commentary being made on the plaintiff, the answer is yes, because the use is relevant to the defendant's goal of developing a cartoon style parody of East Los Angeles. Now, is it explicitly misleading? Well, the court thinks that confusion here is unlikely. The marks have nothing to do with each other. But in any case, you can't base liability on the use of the mark alone when you're using it in an artistically relevant way and therefore the defendants prevail. But note that language, note that indication that you have to have something more than mere use of the mark in something that is artistically relevant because the Ninth Circuit has returned to that issue fairly recently in a case that we will discuss in our next lecture concerning the limits to and potential limits to the Rogers framework. And so we'll leave it there. Thanks very much.